Welcome to Eton, a small but beautiful Berkshire town known all over the world as the home of one of England's most prestigious schools of all. Having played host to leading figures of British history for hundreds of years, Eton is brimming with heritage on every corner. And as we take a tour of the town's streets on this pleasant morning, we'll not only catch a glimpse of day-to-day -day life for the students of the prominent Eton College, but we'll also admire the town's wide array of elegant architecture, take a stroll along the historic High Street, pass by a collection of centuries-old taverns and houses, and also take in views across the River Thames, towards the historic royal town of Windsor, located, literally, just a stone's throw away. All of that is to come over the next 35 minutes or so, but we'll begin our walk in the northern part of town, where local life is dominated by the workings of Eton College. Founded nearly 600 years ago in 1440, Eton College is one of the oldest and most prestigious schools in England, originally established by none other than King Henry VI to act as a feeder or sister institution to King's College at the University of Cambridge. To prepare students for university life, Eton, an all-boys secondary school, functions not all that much unlike the University of Cambridge. Most notably, Eton is one of only three public schools in the country which retain an all-boarding tradition, meaning that all of its students, from 13 to 18 years old, live at the school throughout the week. Boarding houses are located all over the town, but almost every day students will make their way to this building, referred to as the Upper School, which serves as the main entrance to Eton College home to the bulk of the school's classrooms and many of its oldest buildings, dating back to the era of Henry VI in the 15th century. As Eton is a working school, we won't be able to venture inside and have a look around, although tours are available for visitors during the summer holidays, if you fancy exploring the oldest part of the whole college. But just across the road from the upper school here are two of Eton's most distinctive landmarks, the school hall and the school library, which were completed in 1908. The hall, where assemblies and concerts are traditionally held, is on the left, while the octagonal library, home to a collection of more than 30,000 works, stands imposingly on this street corner, fronted by a seemingly unassuming lamppost. It's not often that local lampposts are worth a mention. But the one which stands at the heart of this school is especially notable. It even has its own name. Known as the Burning Bush, this lamp was erected back in 1864, originally on a small island in the middle of the road beside us. And it's designed to resemble the historic coat of arms of Eton College, with three lilies to represent the school's patron saint, the Virgin Mary, as well as a lion and fleur-de-lis to represent King Henry VI who, at the time of the school's founding, was king of both England and France. With nearly six centuries of heritage under its belt, there are plenty of stories just like that, hiding in plain sight all over Eton's main campus. Historic buildings like the Upper School and College Chapel across the road date back hundreds of years, some to the school's earliest origins back in the mid-15th century. But ever since that time, Eton College has continued growing in size. In the school's first term back in 1440, there was capacity for just a few dozen boys to study here. But today that number has grown to nearly 1,400, as ever more boarding houses, classrooms, libraries and more were built on the streets surrounding the historic heart of the college. Here, for example, we find ourselves on Common Lane, a narrow street which likely began life as a simple country track, but which is now lined by a wealth of charming buildings, many of which play host to some of the historic houses of Eton College. This grand 18th century building, for instance, is the home of Godolphin House, one of the oldest of Eton's now 25 school houses. The building is one of a number which provide purpose-built accommodation to pupils, 
who, as we mentioned, not only study, but live in Eton during term time. Now, if you went to school in Britain, or are familiar with the Harry Potter stories, then you'll have a general idea of how Eton's system of houses works. But of course, things are a little different here from most schools around the country. Apart from the fact that houses correspond to actual buildings where pupils live, Eton's houses are much smaller than most in Britain. There are typically only 50 boys in each house. And as we look through the gates at the 19th century new school buildings here, among the 50 in each school house are pupils from each year group, typically following a traditional structure where older students exercise a leadership role over their younger peers, particularly during the many inter-house competitions in sports and arts which are held throughout the school year. Houses at Eton can be traced back to the school's earliest origins, but the system as we know it today is more a product of the early 18th century, when the very first dedicated boarding houses were constructed. Since then, each of the school's houses have marked out their own illustrious history, even boasting famous alumni, including members of the royal family, former prime ministers, Oscar-winning actors, and many more. But Eton's house system is just one of many features at the college with a lengthy backstory. And just across the road here, we can see towards one of the oldest buildings in the whole school. This grand edifice is the College Chapel, commissioned by Henry VI himself, and which began construction all the way back in 1441, just one year after the school was founded. Immense in size and significance, it took more than 40 years to build the College Chapel, with the Wars of the Roses in the 15th century playing their own part in slowing down construction here through the decades. Not only designed to provide boys at Eton with a dedicated place of worship, Henry VI also hoped that the chapel would become one of England's great places of pilgrimage, on a par with the likes of Westminster Abbey. Over the centuries, thousands of people have made lengthy trips to see this imposing college chapel up close, and we'll get a closer look at it ourselves in just a few minutes' time when we return to Eton's main road. But let's now make our way away from the heart of the college and along Keats Lane here, which takes us westwards past yet more of the school's houses and towards the wide open meadows that surround this historic town. Here we're passing by the fetching Keat House, another 18th century boarding house built for the growing number of pupils at that time. But as we mentioned earlier, Eton College began life with just a handful of boys on the register, hoping to make their way through school and towards the equally prestigious King's College at the University of Cambridge. But Cambridge, and the college also founded by Henry VI, is more than 60 miles away from here. So why did the king choose this place to establish a school? Well, if we take a look at a map, we can see that Eton is located about 20 miles to the west of central London. But more importantly, it's positioned directly across the River Thames from Windsor to the south. That is, of course, where you'll find Windsor Castle, a home of English royalty for nearly a thousand years which is surrounded by vast swathes of crown-owned land, including this patch of earth just across the river. Eton, therefore, directly in the shadow of one of the king's main residences, was the perfect place for his school, which was designed to provide a small number of poorer children with an education that the king hoped would take them all the way to Cambridge. In the early days, it was just a handful of buildings and the beginnings of the college chapel which made up Eton College. But as we know, the school has grown significantly in size since then. And that's why here we find the Lower Chapel, built in 1891 to provide a place of worship for more of the school's pupils. Because by the late 19th century, the mighty college chapel had actually become too small to fit all of the boys enrolled here at Eton. The Lower Chapel may have been built a good 450 years after Henry VI established the school, but expansion was very much part of the plan from the beginning. 
the king gave a large area of land on this northern bank of the river to the provost and fellows of Eton College, the men who would run the school for him. And even today, not all of that land has been built on, possibly leaving room for further expansion. The town of Eton that we know today is situated on land which came into royal ownership around a thousand years ago. And it was through this land that a road linking Windsor to the English capital of London ran, roughly correspondent to the modern day High Street, which we'll walk along later. In the medieval era, a small hamlet evolved alongside that road. But this area remained sparsely populated until the establishment of the school in the 15th century when all of the land surrounding the civilian hamlet was granted to the school. As we've seen, much of that land has been developed by Eton College over time, but the town very quickly comes to an end, because just here we stumble across the South Meadow, one of a number of vast green spaces that surround this relatively small town. This meadow is owned by the college, but it's classified as Lammas land, which allowed commoners to use it for pasture during the autumn and winter seasons. Today that's less of a concern, but many of the open spaces owned by the college are still accessible to the rest of the town's population of around 4,000 people, with a network of public footpaths traversing the grasslands. At the end of our walk we'll venture out onto the lawn of the Brokers, another of Eton College's vast meadows, which offers some lovely views back towards Windsor and the castle on the other side of the Thames. But now let's make our way back towards the main road and the heart of the college, because we need to begin heading southwards, out of the streets dominated by the school here, and towards the heart of the civilian town of Eton. In the modern day, the word Eton is almost entirely synonymous with the college, but the name itself of course dates back to long before the school was first established. In fact, Eton derives very simply from the Old English Eton, which means something like river town, its position beside the Thames of course playing a key role in local history. The lower chapel here is located about a half mile walk from the river, standing as one of the college's main religious landmarks. But it's surrounded here on South Meadow Lane by a couple of intriguing museums as well. Further back towards the meadow, you'll find the Eton Museum of Antiquities, home to a collection of ancient artefacts. While just here is the Eton College Natural History Museum, the largest museum in the town. Though the Natural History Museum here is part of the college, and is used primarily for teaching purposes, it is also open to the public on Sunday afternoons, offering an impressive collection without the crowds of the much larger Natural History Museum over in West London. Now of course, it's no surprise that Eton, one of the most prestigious schools in the country, has its own Natural History Museum. It's one of a number of special facilities which mark this school out as one of the very best of England's public schools. But the term public school is one that often causes confusion. Unlike in other countries where public schools are typically supported by government funds, in England the term derives from public in the sense of being open to anyone, irrespective of where they come from and their family background. This tells us more about exactly why Eton was established by King Henry VI in 1440. The school was founded to provide poorer children with a good education, and it was stipulated that there would be space for 70 poor boys to study and live here free of charge. This remains the case today. Each year 70 boys attend Eton as so-called King's Scholars, having their fees supported by the monarch while the remaining 1,300 or so pupils pay fees to attend classes. Meanwhile, as it seems the bell has rung and students are making their way between classes, you might notice that Etonians wear a rather distinctive school uniform. The school dress here is full of tradition. Boys wear a black tailcoat over a black waistcoat, with pinstripes trousers and a white necktie. This all may seem very antiquated, but the truth is that Eton's famous uniform has actually been heavily modernised since the Victorian era. 
For instance, until 1948, pupils were required to wear top hats. Though today, you'll only see them being brought out for the most special of occasions. There are plenty more interesting quirks to this historic school's many traditions. For instance, the school year isn't divided into an autumn, spring and summer term, but rather three halves, known as Michaelmas, Lent and Summer. In the early days of the school, meanwhile, all classes were conducted in Latin. In fact, it wasn't until the addition of ancient Greek to the syllabus in the 17th century that this changed. And it wasn't until 1851 that maths, taught in English, was finally added to create a more rounded curriculum. Of course, as we can see from the size of the college chapel here, Henry VI established this school as a religious institution, with the study of religious texts in Latin forming the bulk of education here for centuries. While the curriculum is substantially different in the 21st century, Eton's famous method of instruction has been responsible for educating many of Britain's most significant historical figures. No less than 20 Prime Ministers, from the very first PM Robert Walpole to the likes of David Cameron and Boris Johnson, went to school here, as did the likes of Prince William and Prince Harry, and famous names in the art world, like the writer George Orwell. These Old Etonians, and many more, have trodden the streets that we've been exploring so far. But there is of course much more to Eton than just the school. So let's now leave the college behind, and begin heading south towards the heart of the civilian town. An unofficial border between the main school campus and the rest of Eton may be this small stream, which is known as Barnes Pool. Recently restored as a lovely water feature in the heart of town, in the 19th century, Barnes Pool here was used as a sewer, flowing underneath an important bridge which carries the main road through Eton towards Windsor. At this point, the road travels over Baldwin's Bridge, an unassuming water crossing with quite a history. The bridge as we know it today was only built in 1884, but it's rather unusually maintained by a local charity, which was set up by none other than Queen Elizabeth I in 1592, in order to ensure that there was always a passable route between Windsor and London, even when the Thames and Barnes Pool flooded. In more recent years, meanwhile, Baldwin's Bridge here found itself involved in the London Olympics of 1908, when it lay on the route of the men's marathon. The event is recorded by this plaque on the wall, but the 1908 marathon was no typical running race. It was in fact the very first to be run over 26 miles and 385 yards. Today, this is the standard distance of an Olympic marathon, but it was originally chosen rather imprecisely, with a point on the long walk in Windsor, judged by organisers to be about 26 miles from the old White City Stadium in London, where the games were being held. The winning time on that day was 2 hours and 55 minutes, a new world record at the time, no less. Now in the early stages of the race, runners of course hastily made their way down Eaton's High Street just here, which today is lined by a truly beautiful array of shops and other local institutions. If you're visiting Windsor on the other side of the river, it's often a good idea to pop over to Eaton here where you can sit down and sample a collection of cafes, pubs and restaurants without the same crowds that you'll find around the castle. Of course, the many shops of the High Street here are there primarily to serve the people who live in this town, including the boys of Eton College. Just here, for example, we find Welsh and Jeffreys tailors, suppliers of the famous school dress to pupils living and studying just up the road. But Eton College isn't the only historic school that you'll find in this town. Just here we're looking at Eton Pawnee, the local Church of England primary school, which has its own history dating back to 1812. Named for Mark Anthony Pawnee, who established the school as a charity for young children at the time, Eton Pawnee has occupied this fetching building on the high street ever since it moved here in 1863. Now this is one of a number of charitable institutions which were set up around Eton by those at the college. 
As we mentioned earlier, Henry VI granted all the land surrounding the historic hamlet of Eton to the college. But over the years, as the hamlet grew into a village and then a town, those at the college have sought to give back to the local community in a number of ways. The establishment of Eton Pawnee in the early 19th century was just one, while many of the houses that make up the modern town today were also built on land donated to the community by the college. Of course, the college and the local community go hand in hand, and it was only with the growth of Eton College that the civilian settlement here was able to develop too. As we continue along the high street, we'll see plenty more businesses established by people who moved into the area to serve the boys of Eton College. But before we venture further down the town's historic main road, just here we find the Church of St John the Evangelist, the central place of worship for the civilian community outside of the school. Situated in a pleasant and tranquil yard just off the high street, St John's is an often overlooked landmark when placed alongside the much larger college chapel, but it points towards an interesting turning point in Eton's history. This church was built in the mid-1850s to provide a place of worship for the growing numbers of people living here in Eton, but who were not associated with Eton College. Historically, all of the land owned by the school was run by the provost of Eton College, who was to care for the needs of the civilian community as well. But as their number grew throughout the 19th century, it eventually became apparent that there needed to be a separate body to administer the town, independently of the college. Therefore, in 1875, St John the Evangelist here became the parish church of Eton, taking the position held for centuries by the college chapel, and it brought about the creation of the parish of Eton, which encompassed all the people living in this town, apart from those in the college, as well as those in the small neighbouring village of Eton Wick. Now Eton Wick, which is located about a mile to the west of the college, has a similar origin story to its larger neighbour here. After the establishment of the college in the 15th century, a new hamlet emerged on farmland on the very edge of Eton, where a number of tradespeople who worked at the college during the day lived. Along the main road here, meanwhile, the historic hamlet of Eton began to grow rapidly as people established a range of businesses, not just to serve the boys at the college up the road, but also passing trade on the route between Windsor and London and people visiting Windsor who were unable to stay in the heart of the royal town. We'll see a number of those businesses as we near the riverside and the bridge to Windsor. But here, meanwhile, we can see the original building that was occupied by Eton Pawnee School, built back in 1812 with funds provided by Mark Anthony Pawnee, a French master at the college. Now, despite the fact that people have lived along this road since long before the college was built, many of the buildings that line this part of the high street, like the former schoolhouse, are actually relatively new, dating from the 19th and 20th centuries. The main reason for this is simply the immense growth which Eton experienced during the early Victorian era. In fact, more than 3,000 people were living here in the 1840s, a population roughly three quarters the size of what it is today. While the college underwent expansion as the curriculum was modernised, Eton went from a small village located just beside the college to a fully-fledged town, far larger than the school itself. Now just here we're passing by the Henry VI pub, which is named for the school's founder, while just next door is the fetching Old Dial House so-called simply for the small golden sundial that you'll be able to spot on the first floor. With these buildings we're getting a little further back in time. In fact these houses all date mostly from the 18th century, built in the early years of Eton's rapid growth in size. Today they play host to useful local facilities like restaurants, salons and shops, but they stand directly across the road from one of the main buildings in the civilian town the modern council offices. Before the 1950s, Eton's town council was headquartered up by Baldwin's Bridge, but as the gap has grown between the college and the rest of town, the council offices were moved here to the heart of the high street in 1957. Now, while the council offices were built in the 20th century, 
Just a few doors along, there stands one of the oldest buildings on Eaton's High Street. Now home to a barber shop, this timber-framed building dates at its oldest to the 17th century. Since remodelled in places, the building was for a long time known as the Turk's Head, a name for a pub, while there are also a number of pretty little cottages hidden behind the building through this archway. A truly fetching piece of historic architecture, the Turk's Head still isn't the oldest building on the High Street. In fact, that title goes to the more than 600-year-old inn, which stands directly across the road. Unfortunately, given its age, this building is in need of restoration at the minute. But if the scaffolding weren't here, this is the view that we'd be greeted with. A 15th century timber-framed inn known as the Cockpit. Thought to have been built all the way back in 1420, the Cockpit has been one of Eton's most popular taverns through the centuries. Although it unfortunately fell into disrepair at the beginning of the 21st century prompting the restoration that we see unfolding today. But we mustn't let the scaffolding get in the way of another intriguing piece of local heritage. Just here we find a red letterbox, nothing unusual at first, but this one was placed here nearly 170 years ago, in 1854. It's one of the earliest Victorian postboxes still in use in Britain today. In fact, just one year younger than the oldest in the whole country, which was erected in 1853 and located down in the village of Holwell in Dorset. Keep your eyes peeled for that letterbox when you visit Eton for yourself, and hopefully by that time the old cockpit will be nicely restored and looking better than ever. But though it's best known as the cockpit today, the historic tavern, popularly frequented by locals throughout the centuries, was once known by a different name, the Adam and Eve. That was the tavern's name around the time of the 17th century, when it's even said that it was visited by none other than King Charles II. But speaking of pub names, here we stumble upon the Eton Mess. Now a bar and guest house, the Eton Mess takes its name from one of this town's most famous exports of all, a traditional English dessert known as the Eton Mess, which was created at Eton College sometime in the 19th century. A messy mix of berries, cream and meringue, the Eton Mess certainly lives up to its name, and it's usually eaten in the summertime, famously served to the boys here during their annual cricket match against rivals Harrow School. The Crown and Cushion Inn in white, meanwhile, looks across the road towards a small side street, which is known as King Stable Street. As the name suggests, this was once the site of royal stables, where the king's horse and carriage were stationed, at one end of the journey from London. You might be wondering why the stables weren't in Windsor or the castle itself. The reason is said to be that Windsor Bridge, which links Windsor and Eton, would have been weakened by the weight of the royal entourage passing back and forth over the river multiple times a year. So it was decided to place the start point for any of the King's journeys to London just here in Eton. Almost every English monarch since William the Conqueror has passed through Eton during their reign. And at the end of the High Street here, there stands the George Inn, built back in 1750 and named most likely for King George III, the long-serving monarch who spent much of his reign at Windsor Castle and who also regularly visited Eton, even helping to sponsor the expansion of the college during his tenure. George was one of the most significant figures in the history of the college. The boys still celebrate his birthday on the 4th of June every year, while the occasion of his death in 1820, at Windsor Castle just across the bridge here, was marked with deep sorrow. Some even say that the black colour of the school dress comes from funeral wear that boys wore at the time. As we know, Eton is linked intrinsically to the royal family, not only founded by King Henry VI, but also located literally a stone's throw away from the royal town of Windsor, separated from it only by the River Thames here. Historically, the protection provided by the river was one of the reasons that William the Conqueror chose the site of Windsor to build a castle. But in the 12th century, a bridge was built across the Thames, enabling a permanent link from the castle to the road to London. 
This bridge, known as Windsor Bridge, is a descendant of that historic river crossing, and it offers some of the most wonderful views of the Thames, towards the royal town of Windsor, and of course, over Eaton's riverside as well. From this point, it's difficult to resist leaving Eaton behind and venturing across the bridge into Windsor, but we'll have to leave that for another video, because there are still a few more interesting spots for us to visit on this north side of the river. So let's cross back over the bridge, following a route taken by kings and queens through the centuries, and back into the town centre. From here we're going to take a brief walk along the riverside towards the Brokers, yet more wide open meadows owned by the college, which offer yet more breathtaking views across the Thames towards Windsor. But before we get there, looking back towards the George Inn, take a note of the small brick building to the left. Situated in the pub garden, it's now used as a function room, but it began life as another set of horses stables. A large number of horses of course were stationed here at the start and finish of journeys to and from London. But the George Inn is far from the only historic tavern to be found in this part of Eton. Here we find ourselves on Brockers Street, which follows the path of the River Thames, and which is also home to the Waterman's Arms, another traditional pub which has a history dating all the way back to 1682. It hasn't been used as a pub for quite that long. In fact, the Waterman's Arms began life as a private home, belonging to the local brewer Robert Stile, before it was later used as a workhouse in the 19th century. Only afterwards did the building become a tavern, and it was frequented mostly by local watermen and lightermen, men who worked on the River Thames ferrying people and goods to and from London. Now, historically, alongside the Waterman's Arms, this street was taken up mostly by stables, used for all the King's horses. But today, Brockers Street is lined by rows of houses, and behind the ones on our right, boat houses used by Eton College's Distinguished Rowing Club. We'll get a closer look at Eton's Riverside Boathouse in a minute, but Brockers Street, as the name suggests, leads us towards the Brockers here the vast meadow which belongs to Eton College, and which runs along the northern bank of the River Thames. Open to the public, these fields are named after the de Brockes family, who historically owned much of the land where Eton exists today. In the early 14th century, much of this area was granted to the aristocrat, Sir John de Brockes, by King Edward III. But after Eton College was established in the 15th century, these beautiful open green spaces were given to the school. As we mentioned earlier, people were historically allowed to use these meadows for pasture during the autumn and winter months. But today the Brockers are often best known as the place to take a pleasant riverside walk, with the Thames and the sights of Windsor just across the water right beside. In the distance once again is Windsor Castle, while in the foreground is a traditional River Thames scene, as swans swim against the current, and a ferry waits on the opposite bank. Now once upon a time, things weren't quite as tranquil as they are today. This was a heavily commercial stretch of the Thames that was used by barges, before the advent of trains to carry goods to and from London. But in the late 18th century, Etonians also began rowing on the Thames here, and over time what started out as a simple leisure activity became quite a serious sport. As we can see, boat houses to store the college's rowboats were constructed here by the river, and rowing soon established itself as one of Eton's favourite sports of all. Today, Eton College has a dedicated rowing lake a short distance away on Dorney Lake, which was also used as the venue for rowing events during the London Olympics in 2012, while many Etonians who learned their rowing skills here have of course gone on to race in the world famous university boat race between Oxford and Cambridge. But having now made our way through the heart of town from the historic college, it's here by the river that our walk around Eton has sadly reached its end. Thank you for watching this video, I really hope you enjoyed it, and I hope you're looking forward to visiting Eton for yourself sometime soon.